Okay, well, good evening, everybody. I'm thankful that people have turned up for this second time and uh, some people who didn't, uh, weren't here for the first time. So I'm pleased that you are here. I have um, gone through and as I said a little while ago, talking to Denny, it's amazing that there is so much more research on this in, uh, incredible woman than there was when I first looked her up, which was many, many years ago. And the reason I searched her name was because I was reading a um, memoir written by Nabokov. It was about when he was a small boy, uh, his family was aristocratic, living in Russia, and they had a wonderful uh, country mansion. And he used to go up into one of the rooms at the top of the house and look through the books that had ended up there rather than downstairs in the family bookshelves. He had been an avid um, uh, butterfly collector as a young boy, and he was in his early teens. And he said he looked through a book by Maria Sibylla Marianne, who had gone to Suriname. And he'd given her date, it was a 17th century date. And I'm thinking, she went to Suriname, how interesting, because I am interested in early explorations, but I didn't ever think about anyone going to collect butterflies. Incidentally, Nabokov himself was a renowned butterfly collect collector, and he later gained some status, in fact, he was a, a curator at the Natural Museum in Harvard, and um, he became famous for uh, the studies that he had done on the blue butterflies of South America. And there is a wonderful book called Nabokov's Blues um, by Johnson and Coates. So there we are my little reading of Nabokov's um, memoirs led to an interest in uh, Maria Sibylla Marianne and then a further interest in what Nabokov himself had done. Having said that, I am not a butterfly person in particular. I like to see them. I don't remember the names, nor do I remember the names of many of the birds that my birding friends tell me about. I'm a little better with flowers, but as Denny and Teresa would uh, uh, support, I don't remember those names all the best either. Anyway, I'm talking about a woman who was a painter and an engraver, which you know is an art. She was an entomologist before the term was coined. For a time, she was a member of a very strict religious sect. She divorced. She traveled to a very foreign land. She was a writer and a publisher, and as you will see, quite an amazing businesswoman. Now, in 1997, the United States did issue a, a stamp in her honor. Uh, it is from uh, one of the many, many paintings she did, picturing uh, a plant, but also a butterfly, and the other creatures that precede that butterfly. And then in uh, 2015, uh, there were other stamps issued by uh, the United States called the wedding stamps. And the designer was somebody called Jeanne Greco. And she added a small deep crimson heart that adds a dash of color. As I pursued Marianne, I had to say to myself, I was saying that heart doesn't make sense. You will see that Marianne was not a sentimental type of person. Uh, anyway, it was wonderful to see that her, she was um, commemorated by a stamp. In earlier than that, uh, Germany had issued uh, a banknote before the EU uh, honoring uh, Maria Sibylla Marianne. And on the back, again, it pictured a flower. Um, and then uh, uh, Germany built uh, uh, an important research vessel and its name is uh, Maria S. Marianne. So she has been honored in her birth country. 
Now, she was born in Frankfurt on April the 2nd, 1647 to Matthaus Marianne and his second wife, Joanna Sibylla Hain. She was Marianne's ninth child. You can read that, I know. I'm just going to go over it and then I won't read all the time there is text. Uh, Matthaus Marianne, her father, was a Swiss born engraver who spent most of his life in Frankfurt, where he also ran a publishing house. Now, I need to say something about Frankfurt at that time. Uh, as in some of the other low countries uh, in that part of Europe, uh, it was a progressive city. Uh, it was um, a city which welcomed people who plied their crafts. Uh, it had a very active middle class. Uh, women were not quite as restricted from some of the activities as they were in other European cities at the time. Uh, at the time close to when Maria was born, it was an imperial free city. Uh, it carried out a lot of trades. It had survived the plague, which was quite serious throughout Europe in the early 1600s. And it had become a city of great importance, not least because it uh, had already initiated a book trade. So the family was uh, well established, we would say as a middle-class family. And Maria um, did, uh, did have contact with the family uh, uh, of, his, uh, of his first marriage as well. Then her mother uh, married um, somebody called uh, Jacob Marel, a German flower painter and print and tulip dealer. Now, interestingly, he had worked in Utrecht in the 1630s to 40s. That was the period of that great tulip mania which swept Holland. These are uh, tulips which he uh, painted. And you will see that as in so many paintings of the time, butterflies or crickets or other insects were used as um, decorative parts of the painting. When we come to look at Sibylla Marianne, uh, Mar uh, Marianne's paintings, we'll see that they were not just purely decorative, they actually served a purpose. Anyway, he named the cultivars here. The one on the left here, is a boatman or butterman. This one was a nobleman. Um, this one was um, the great plumed one. And this one with the wind. And uh, some of those um, named tulips are still available today. Now, Maria must have shown talent as a young child because Morel took her on as an apprentice. Now, this was not altogether unusual. Um, in the print uh, world, um, women did occasionally apprentice as Mar uh, Maria did herself. And as we know, in some of the uh, Italian studios at the time, women also apprenticed as painters. Um, so she did have background and she did have studies in watercolour and painting. She studied watercolour colour, and she studied drawing in the studio along with other apprentices, because indeed that was another way in which you made money to um, cultivate your business. Now, she says that at the age of 13, she was uh, spending her time investigating insects. She wrote, at the beginning, my left click, Denny, at the beginning, uh, I observed that far more beautiful butterflies and moths developed from caterpillars other than silkworms, which led me to collect all the caterpillars I could find in order to study their metamorphosis. I therefore withdrew from society and I've devoted myself to these investigations at the same time. This is a young teen writing this. I wish to become proficient in the skill of painting in order to paint and describe them from life. 
Now, she also began what she called her study book. And I know myself, I am so inconsistent in going on with anything like that. She was not. She kept that study book throughout her life. And much of it ended up, here is the Russian connection, in the library of Peter the Great. And we'll go back to mentions of Peter the Great uh, towards the end of the presentation. Now at 18, in 1665, Maria marries Johann Graf, a pupil of her stepfather's. In 1668, her daughter Johanna was born. And then in 1670, the family moved to Nuremberg. They lived in the Graf family house, the house of the golden sun. Now I'm going to try and do something and I'll go back. That's the house. Amazingly, Nuremberg was bombed incredibly uh, in the Second World War, but the house survived. And um, I'll make a mention shortly to where Maria kept her um, uh, boxes of the caterpillars and insects that she was collecting. So that was the house where they lived. And Nuremberg these days is trying to uh, maintain that connection with uh, Maria Sibylla Marianne because after all, she lived there for 11 years. Now, Maria was busy. She continued her insect studies in the garden close to the house and in other gardens outside the city walls. Nuremberg had already grown quite uh, to be quite a large city and people went beyond the city in order to have enough room to plant their gardens. Uh, as well, she earned some money. She gave lessons in painting. And as well, in 1675, she published a book, a model book providing pattern to be copied in paint or embroidery. So these were books of flowers. Uh, they, uh, you could pull the pages out and you could use them as your model. There are very, very few copies of these left, of this book left um, because it was so incredibly popular. And then in 1768, she gave birth to her second daughter. So there was a big gap between the two uh, girls. That was the house. And now what I'd like to try and do with Maria Sibylla Marianne, because what we usually read is the uh, chronology and the information about her uh, insect collecting, but I want to think of her as a person. So here she was, definitely middle-class, definitely literate because it was uh, a Calvin, a Calvinist or Lutheran uh, uh, religion. Uh, it was important that you could read the Bible. She was religious. She probably had quite a bit of help in the house actually, given the status that uh, her husband had in Nuremberg. She has friends, she always made friends. She writes to her mother in Frankfurt. Perhaps she visits, she plays with her daughter. She teaches her daughter, she visits gardens and uh, quite a number of the significant uh, inhabitants of Nuremberg welcomed her to their gardens. She collects insects. Now boxes with insects were on the tables in the upper stories of the house. She observes them, she studies the plants they feed upon, the timing of the metamorphosis, the behavior of each species. She She's meticulous in the keeping of her study book. She works at her desk, she paints. She does engrave, possibly going to her husband's place of business to practice that craft. She writes. She must be busy with her husband, with her child. She tries to keep up with and participate in discussion about insects and lava and butterflies. She becomes pregnant with her second child, she gives birth she works on a major book. In 1679, she's ready to publish it, one year after the birth of Dorothea. So she publishes this book called The Caterpillar's Wondrous Metamorphosis and Particular Nourishment from Flowers, briefly described from nature, painted, engraved in copper, and published by Maria Sibylla Graf, 
herself, daughter of Matthaus Marian the Elder. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, but you'll notice that she says here she published under the name of Maria Sibylla Graf, but she also mentions Matthaus Mariam the Elder. Um, that becomes significant later on because she never uses the name of Graf later on when she publishes. Um, this was uh, issued uh, in uh, a number of uh, editions. Um, it created quite a stir because you will see she shows the various stages here in this very typical wreath, which often accompanied um, books about flowers. Uh, she says, without any uh, qualms, this work has taken me five years of scientific and artistic activity. I collected and raised the insects, fed them with host plants, observed them, described and drew their metamorphoses from egg to caterpillar, from pupa to butterfly. This was her first scientific book. It was a small edition on plain paper through the publisher used by her husband. Now, the study of insect metamorphosis was going on, but she actually preceded any of the other scientific studies which were being talked about. Um, there was Jan Goddard, 1662 to 1669, who was looking at the metamorphoses, and there was Jan Swamadam. They were um, recognized scientists looking at this phenomenon. She was observing it and she was illustrating it, and she notes her observations in first person, states dates and times. It had that incredibly personal touch that was lacking in the other scientific procedures that were being carried out. And again, sadly, few copies survive. You'll notice that this one is held in the Museum of Medical History Books in Muri, Switzerland, because of course, so much of the botanical study at the time was usually under the directional auspices of um, the medical gardens, which had been cultivated by monks and the medical knowledge that was acquired by women um, in the uh, field, as it were. In significant in all of um, Maria Sibylla Marianne's plant studies is the um, central, central, central placement of the plant with the um, caterpillar or the pupa and the moth or the butterfly situated in the plant that it feeds upon. Um, this uh, was the, um, uh, a study for the, one of the images that later on appeared in her um, scientific manual, as it were. Then in 1681, Maria and the children moved back to Frankfurt to be with her recently widowed mother. And then came another rather extraordinary thing. Maria with her daughters, seven and 17, and her mother traveled from Frankfurt to Friesland in Holland to join a religious sect called the Labadists. And again, we read this on the page, but we have to imagine what is going on. This was a very strict sect. She's moving from uh, Frankfurt into uh, another area of Europe altogether. Uh, she has to arrange to, for them to go. It's by carriage, a lot of turmoil, a lot of organization, explaining to her husband. And on top of that, it was a journey of over 400 kilometers. And I tried to work this out um, in my own way, which seemed to me that it was um, at least a 50 kilometer per day in a carriage. 
they had to stop somewhere, they had to eat. Anyway, it, to me, again, it's a woman of um, incredible uh, aptitude and uh, determination. And why she was doing it, we probably will never really know. Where's my mouse gone? Sorry. Um, so they moved to uh, this um, religious community, uh, which was very strict. But interestingly, um, Maria Sibylla Marianne still managed to do some um, observations, some scientific observation. This is a, a beautiful painting of a frog and uh, the uh, way in which the frogs uh, are reproduced. Um, and she did that uh, at a time when uh, it uh, wasn't expected that women would have much leisure time at this um, religious community she moved to. She moved to a community which had been established by somebody called Jean de Labadie. Uh, he was dead by the time she moved to that community, but the house where the community was settled was owned by um, a very um, prestigious um, uh, man from Holland called Cornelius van Sommelsdijk. Uh, the house was uh, owned by him. It was called the Walter Castle in the village of Vierwerd. I hope somebody who can speak Dutch could say that better than I. Um, John de Labadie was uh, a charismatic uh, character and it wasn't unusual at that time for people to strive to join a more um, austere religious group. And he left the Jesuits. Uh, he eventually started a new religion. And it was part of the pietist movement, which was sweeping through uh, parts of Europe at that time. Now, I did include one of his quotes because I can see how somebody might be attracted just to his um, tremendous uh, rhetoric, as it were. We lose ourselves in thy vastness, we plunge into thy depths. We're dazzled by thy light and are blinded by the infinite brightness. We are absorbed into thy ocean. He had a tremendous number of followers at one point. Uh, and interestingly, there were Labadist communities established in Maryland in the United States. And for a long, long while, you could find Labadist looms and Labadist wool in current uh, United States. Uh, so they stayed in the community for a long while. This drawing was done by her husband who came hoping to encourage her and the daughters to come back. Uh, she persuaded the uh, hierarchy at the um, uh, community that he didn't share their religious beliefs and he was sent away. They later divorced. Uh, and there's no reference to him by Maria Sibylla Marianne ever after. And of course, if one were writing a novel, you'd want to write, well, what was going on? Why did this happen? That doesn't occur. Uh, then in 1690, Maria's mother died. 1691, Maria and her daughters leave the Labadis community and they go to settle in Amsterdam. Five years of seclusion were over. Now, Amsterdam at that time was a thriving community. Uh, you know that the Dutch East Indies was incredibly um, rich and had certainly contributed to um, Amsterdam's position in the world. Um, there were many um, uh, people who were avid collectors forming their wonderful cabinets of curiosities. Um, this is Albert Siebers, whose cabinet of curiosity was world famous at the time. Uh, she um, moved back to, she moved to Amsterdam and she established herself as a painter. Uh, she was recognized because of her book as a woman of talent. Uh, she had access to other uh, people who were interested in uh, collections. 
and interested in what she was doing. She had contact with uh, Comelan, who was the um, curator of the uh, Amsterdam garden, which was still basically a medical garden that was gradually being transformed into a, um, a botanical garden. She makes money, she teaches painting, uh, she keeps on with her uh, insect collecting. Uh, she did a uh, completed paintings for a wealthy horticulturalist, so we know that she wasn't uh, short of money. But she wanted to do something. And so there was some puzzlement when in 1699 she placed a newspaper advertisement offering 255 of her paintings for sale. Why? she wanted to go to Suriname. Now Suriname was a Dutch colony, as you can see at the uh, northern part of South America. Uh, it um, was a colony that the Dutch had uh, developed. Uh, it was sugar not native to that area, but brought. It was a crop that grew very well there. Uh, the journey was not easy, two months by sea. Uh, she leaves with her daughter, Dorothea, on June 1699. Now, the colony had, had uh, was swapped by the English for Manhattan. So the English were happy with what they got and the Dutch thought this was going to be a wonderful place for them to be. Um, it did have a Labadist connection, which again uh, is interesting because uh, Cornelius van Sommeldijk, uh, whose um, property was used for uh, the um, Labadist community, was one of the directors of the Dutch East Indy Company. And uh, there were three directors. And at this particular time, the colony was beginning to have some issues because of conflict between the slaves, which were, had been imported, and the native people who had been displaced. But why did, um, um, why did she want to go there? Well, because it was the source of so many of the exotic insects that Marianne had seen in the cabinets of curiosities. She wanted to examine their habitat to see what plants they lived on, how they changed. And this is her own words. In Holland, I saw with wonderment the beautiful creatures brought back from the East and West Indies, but without their origins and subsequent development. In other words, how they develop from caterpillars into chrysalises. All this, list, all this has led me to undertake a long dreamed of journey to Suriname. Now, the idol, luxuriant vegetation, fantastic insects. The day to day, it was a slave colony and it was very rigorously managed. Uh, it was, as most slave colonies were, harsh, terrible consequences uh, meted out to uh, slaves who didn't fulfill their duties. Uh, dense vegetation, challenging, intense tropical heat, fascinating, often biting insects. It was a new world for Maria and her daughter to study. They did go upriver to Providence, the Labadist settlement, the furthest of all the plantations from civilization. It was a four day paddle with stops at remote plantations. The river was the only link. Now, I have lived in tropical climates we all know that it can be incredibly hot, incredibly steamy. And she, Maria Sibylla Marianne is trying to keep notes. She doesn't stop. She observes, she asks questions, she collects, she sketches. She takes all sorts of things back to her house. 
Her house is full of things to be studied, recorded, wondered at. And the Labadist community they went to was definitely having a lot of struggles, again, partly because of conflicts with the native inhabitants and because it was hard for people to uh, maintain their, um, their, their goals, their aims when they were living in such very, very difficult situations. And now I, again, I want us to move beyond just the beautiful work she did, but to imagine how they got on. What did they wear? Well, we know they wore long skirts. They had long sleeves because they needed to protect themselves. Did they wear corsets? I would hope not. They had to have hats. Very, very hot. Who do they go out with? Well, she did recruit uh, basically slaves to go with her. Um, what did they take to collect things with? They came back to work at night on what they on their collections and to make uh, studies. How did they work at night? No light, so little light. What did they have? A candle, maybe uh, some sort of other lantern. She observes the insects they've collected. They send some back to the Netherlands, coating them in turpentine oil. And why were they doing that? Because they needed the money. They are paid for the specimens they send back. They make drawings and Maria thinks about the engravings she will make. They're plagued by ants, by wasps, by spiders, by mosquitoes. They fear snakes and they have allergic reactions to some caterpillars. Now here is one of her drawings and we'll read about the, talk about the book that she creates. This is of the cassava plant with the moth of the rustic sphinx, caterpillar and chrysalis of the tetrio sphinx moth and the garden tree boa. So here we are, we've got so much representation in that beautiful painting, but it's not the botanical painting that we so often came to expect, which was, um, almost ethereal. These are not ethereal at all. They're full of the life of the um, situation that she's looking at. Um, Amerindian women and slaves came to her house with specimens they thought she might like to see. Slaves were assigned to her household and they accompanied her when she went to collect. Now, the sugar plantation owners she was a rarity. They mocked her because she was interested in something other than sugar. That's what they were there for, to make money from the sugar plantations. Uh, it wasn't an exotic posting for people or uh, uh, ownership for people as it was in Indonesia or the Dutch uh, East Indies. This was very, very tough. Now, here we are sampling her bananas and look how rugged and uh, tough they look. She says they have a pleasant flavor like apples in Holland, can be eaten raw or cooked. She spent time at the markets. She and Dorothea sampled the fruits. They asked questions and they sought answers. Um, the native women who accompanied her on the collecting missions gave her information about the properties of plants. Uh, the Indians and Africans who are not treated well by their Dutch masters use the seeds of the peacock flower to abort the children so that their children will not become slaves like they are. Indeed, they even kill themselves on account of the usual harsh treatment meted out to them for they consider that they will be born again with their friends in a free state in their own country. So we can't think that she wasn't sympathetic to the situation of the people she was observing. Uh, interesting because I'm sure we have all wondered about uh, the um, options for abortion from um, plants or 
uh, here she is. Uh, the native people themselves knew what they needed to find if they wanted to abort. Now, the peacock flower happens to be the flower of Barbados, and I'm sure they're not associating it all the time with that quality that Maria Sibylla Marianne recognized. Um, and indeed, I've seen it growing in uh, tropical North Queensland, and it is a very, very beautiful plant. Uh, I didn't know until I read Maria Sibylla Marianne that it had uh, other properties. Uh, so she made uh, watercolor after watercolor of the plants and the creatures she was observing. This is the palisade tree with the life cycle of the giant silk moth and a branch of the gumbo limbo tree with the white witch moth. Now, as it happened, as people in subsequent centuries looked at Marion's drawings, they often said, well, that's not the right uh, plant and that's not the right um, uh, chrysalis. Um, there were some errors, but they were none of them uh, significant enough to detract from what she was trying to do and from the mastery of the painting. And she was not immune to the beauty of what she was doing. This is a branch of the pomegranate with the blue morpho butterfly. And I love her description. The butterfly's wings looked like polished silver overlaid with the loveliest ultramarine green and purple. Its beauty cannot possibly be rendered with the paintbrush. The Menelaus blue butterfly. Here we have a branch of the West Indian cherry with the Achilles morpho butterfly and the, sorry, the uh, frangipani with the red uh, cracker butterfly. Um, beautiful. And again, striking because they were not like the typical um, floral uh, paintings of the time. They were bolder and richer. Uh, the cotton leaf physicut with the giant sphinx, sphinx moth. Um, people often reference this because they say she must have had a magnifying glass to see the way in which the sphinx moths um, coiled, coiled. You couldn't see that with the naked eye. Um, there was a, 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 a micro, at the beginning of the microscope uh, being used by people. I doubt that she would have had one there with her in um, Suriname. Now, Marianne described the behavior of the caterpillar of the giant sphinx moth in great detail, noting that it thrashed around wildly when it touched, she touched it. And then it went, when it became a chrysalis, that too was very restless. Amazing, amazing observation and determination to observe. Now, this one is really interesting. Uh, a tarantula. Uh, devouring a hummingbird. Hummingbirds use spider's webs to rest in, she wrote. They have to be careful when untangling themselves that they do not become prey to the spider. In the 19th century, she was initially ridiculed by entomologists as totally fanciful. No one had ever heard of a spider eating a bird. Then, Two Brazilian entomologists in 2009 described two records of the Theraphosid spider preying on birds in the Brazilian Amazon. And they wrote, I've got their material somewhere here, um, thus making our small homage to Maria Sibylla Marianne. Many of the things that people uh, thought were errors were later found to be fairly accurate. And that's a, a lovely account. Uh, I, I always picture them as young entomologists. They may not have been, but they uh, wrote their tribute to her. Um, then <laughs> 
Then uh, Maria Sibylla Marianne became ill. She said, the climate didn't treat me kindly. She had to go back to Holland. So Maria and Dorothea returned to the Netherlands with a large collection of plants and insects, some alive, some ready to metamorphose, and some specimens preserved in brandy. They took back everything they could possibly put together uh, so that they would have what they needed when they got back there to continue their um, work of art. Um, I brought with me such butterflies and beetles and everything that would keep in brandy, everything I could press. I am now, and when I go back, I will paint in the same way that I did when I was in Germany, but I'm going to try and paint everything on vellum. That is um, a, um, a material from um, the um, skin of animals. Um, much more expensive, and uh, she obviously had plans for producing quite a remarkable book. Um, she had to make money when she got back to Holland, so she started by exhibiting her specimens, by selling them, by arranging through her contacts to bring back more insects, plants, curiosities. Then she began her correspondence with collectors, uh, people she knew would probably be prepared to pay money to buy some of her uh, productions. And I'm going to read out what she says about herself. After I had come back to Holland and my paintings had been seen by several amateur naturalists, note she doesn't want to claim that she's um, corresponding with the cream of the crop, they, passed, they pressed me considerably to have them published for they were of the opinion that this was the first and most remarkable work ever painted in America. This involved carrying out this work, what was involved in carrying out this work dissuaded me at first, but finally I decided to go ahead. The work consists of 60 copper plate engravings where on about 90 studies of caterpillars, worms and maggots are depicted showing how they change color and form when they shed their skins. Now she had to um, bother people to subscribe to this publication because as I said before, it was so incredibly expensive. And I'm reading now from a letter. She wrote to a, um, a, a well-known collector in uh, Holland by the name of Volkamer. I likewise to speak, uh, beseech you to speak to some of the booksellers and particularly to him by whom I send you one of my American insects for payment. If he should desire one or 200 more of my American insects, I will deliver him the prints. And if he desire it, I will also deliver him the paper that he may get the declaration printed in English, besides I shall deliver him the book as uh, well as the paper as a mo at a moderate rate as possible uh, for his and the nation's satisfaction. Uh, the publication of the book was incredibly difficult. She did some of the engravings herself. She noted who were the engravers who uh, carried out some of the other work and she dedicated it to all the lovers and observers of nature, aimed at pleasing both connoisseurs of art and amateur naturalists interested in insects and plants. Uh, her two daughters assisted with the design. Uh, she employed three, uh, as I said, engravers, all of whom she named. Um, she supervised she provided the painters with highly finished drawings in gouache and watercolor. And then she marketed her book in four different ways. You could buy it uncolored for 15 florins, hand colored using watercolors and gouache for 45 florins, hand colored counterproofs for 75 florins, 
She wrote to people like um, Petiver in England, who was an apothecary with an incredible collection of specimens, uh, begging him to flog the book for her so that she would continue to have the money to publish. And then importantly, she made two rare deluxe versions for two collectors, as she said, of discerning taste. The physician and collector Richard Mead, whose collection was later purchased by George III, and the physician and collector Sir Henry Sloan, who bequeathed his collection to the nation, his various gifts forming the foundation of the British Museum. Now, I need to say a little uh, something else here. We can't imagine from our point of view now what the importance of these collections were. People who wanted to show their, their taste, their erudition, were madly collecting these specimens from the New World, whether it was to plant in the garden of, um, of Josephine, Napoleon's wife, whether it was to plant in your own garden, whether it was to have a cabinet of curiosities. You had to have it. In our day and age, when we can buy a book or we can go and see a sample of something, it doesn't seem warranted, but then it was the most important thing you could do to show that you were keeping up with what was going on in the world. And so she had the book. Uh, the book could be bought as a simple book. Uh, and again, uh, she was hoping to be able to publish it in uh, Latin and English. Um, but I did include this one because it's very similar to the stamp that was used in by the United States. And she also said how wonderful the taste of the pineapple was. It tasted like all the fruits of the world. She had plans for a second volume and a reissue of the first in French and English. However, she died before that could be realized. She died in Amsterdam on January the 17th, 1770, 1717. The book was reissued after her death with extra plates, many of them done by her daughters. Incredible again, um, wonderful, wonderful uh, images. An egret from a later publication attributed to Dorothea. Now I've included this because uh, this is the only, um, gee, only known portrait. We did see an earlier one, which people say was probably created based on this particular one here. Um, this was done by her son-in-law uh, and it shows her in a typical position for a person who would have a cabinet of curiosities pointing to things. But I've also given up here and if you have a pen you can copy it or you can rem remember it, it's not too difficult. Wonderful information uh, about uh, previous and current studies on Maria Sibylla Marianne from the Maria Sibylla Marianne Society dot humanities dot uh, University of Amsterdam dot Netherlands. And there they have sections on her life, on her work, on sources, on research and essays and links. Uh, this was uh, an outcome of the two 2017 um, uh, conference uh, that was held and which brought a lot of academic uh, uh, researchers together to talk about Maria Sibylla Marianne. And now another researcher that you can look up and there is a lot of current information coming out through Kay Etheridge. Um, and I've just included two other of the wonderful drawings from her time in Suriname. Um, Kay Etheridge says, Marion spent at least five decades studying the much smaller number of species of moths and butterflies inhabiting Northern Europe and roughly two years among the countless species in Suriname. Bearing in mind the challenges of working in a hot, 
humid and alien environment, what she achieved in such a short period is astonishing. Errors made in some of her entries have been overemphasized. All scientists, she says, make mistakes, even Darwin and Newton. Marion published a book depicting about 100 species of insects and 53 species of plants. Now, Kay Etheridge is herself a field biologist, and she says, whereas the field biologist today, with many more resources than Marianne, will typically study one or at a most, or at the most, a handful of species in his or her career. Now, I actually have this wonderful book on Marion's butterflies. It is very beautiful. Um, I, I would be happy to lend it to somebody of, um, with, who would exercise great care if they were truly interested in um, Maria Marion's butterflies. And then in 2016, this uh, incredible folio uh, was published of the work. Um, I haven't yet seen that it's been acquired by UBC, although when I was putting this together a number of years ago, I did go to the library and they have a lot of material on her. Um, but um, I would say if you're really interested in her, it could be quite possible that you might find it in some library uh, collection. And then I'm going to conclude with what was the botany photo of the day uh, from uh, the UBC Botanical Garden of August 15, 2019. This beautiful plant, scientifically described and named by the Colombian botanist Jose Jeromino Triana in 1873, the Mariana Nobilis. And I have to attribute the photo to Priscilla Bircher. So there are many other uh, butterflies. There are um, uh, uh, other creatures named uh, after Maria Sibylla Marianne, mostly uh, from the late uh, uh, 1800s on. And I'll conclude while looking at this lovely photo and saying that in, 19th, in the 19th century Britain, they were the most extraordinary things written about how it was so inappropriate for a woman to go to such a hot climate to do such incredible collecting. That was the job that should have been left to men. Fortunately, those sentiments are no longer uh, voiced uh, and hopefully no longer felt. She truly was uh, a woman ahead of her time she was exceptional as an artist and a naturalist and exceptional and enigmatic as a person. So with that, I conclude my presentation on Maria Sibylla Marianne.